together today. You can help us out with this first one by putting your hands together with us here. Fills 
deserves the glory in this place today. Amen. Come on now. Every victory is his. Every battle is won by him. We give him the glory in this place today. For every battle, every victory. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. When all I see is the battle, see my victory.
this morning can resonate with that. The battle that you're walking through right now, God is in control of that if you allow him to be in control of that, amen? Hey, this morning we have an awesome opportunity. One of the best parts of what we do, we get to baptize people this morning. Yeah. In Matthew chapter 28, it talks about going forth and making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this morning, that's what we're about, right? We're making disciples, right? A couple people are excited. Hopefully, by the time you get up here and speak, they'll be ready. Um, but yeah, we're excited this morning, you guys. And the cool thing about this is these are all young people that are getting baptized this morning. Um, so this is awesome because sometimes, like as parents or as a little bit of an older generation, we need to be leading the way in things. But I love that our kids are seeing what it means to be a Christian and to walk through that in their life. And so this morning, we're going to baptize some, some youth, some kids, and we're excited for that. So Pastor Tyler, rock and roll. Fantastic. All right. First up, we have Amelia Schoen. She's going to get baptized today. Amelia, why do you want to get baptized today? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, you can go ahead. Amelia, upon your confession of faith, I hereby baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Deja Vu, they're twins. So this is her twin sister, Peyton. And Peyton, why do you want to get baptized today? I want to get baptized because I want to take the next step. Fantastic. All right, you can go ahead and get in. Sorry, it's a little chilly. I apologize for that. But all right, and then scoot forward a little bit. All right. Peyton, upon your confession of faith, I hereby baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What's your name? Noel in Paris. What? Noel in Paris. Should I ask you like 40 questions? I'm okay with that. Ooh. <laughs> How much time do you guys have? Hey, uh, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. So why do you want to be baptized today? Because I want to be closer to God. That's good stuff. Let's get in, buddy. Noah, 
son, as your dad, this is one of the greatest honors of my life right here. You know that? So on the confession of your faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. Bridge of you. You know, it's funny, the things that go through your mind during worship, isn't it? We sang this last song, and uh, at the end of it, it says, All I am is yours, and now I get to take the offering. Yeah, right? But I wanted to say something about that. We do want to take the offering, and we want to thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Uh, it's amazing. It really is amazing, even through these past several years, uh, financially, how this church has just thrived. And that's because of you, and thank you for your faithfulness. But I want to direct your attention to Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. And if you have your Bible, you can look at that. But I'll just tell you what it says. It says, Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the measure that you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, we don't always understand the language of that day and, you know, the agricultural uh, culture that they were a part of and how Jesus spoke. But in this case here, a lot of times what they would do is they would, they would go into town and they would buy grain. And so this is a picture of them taking a basket and setting it on a cloth, and then that measure of grain would be poured in there. Shake it a little bit so it settles down. You get as much as possible. Press down so that you're getting as much as possible, shaken together, press down, and then just keep doing that until the basket filled up and it would be running over. And that's why they had that cloth. And then they would pick it up and they would just wrap that blanket on top of it so that they could get all of it and they would hold it right here in their bosom. And that's the picture of the abundance with which God will bless us. Do you know that he doesn't need our money? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Uh, the other day, Joyce and I were buying a, a new bull. We needed a bull for our herd because we got rid of all our bulls. They're in the freezer now. And so as we were looking at this bull and the herd of cows, I thought, you know, God loves cattle. Cattle are way back in the Bible, right all the way back from the beginning and all the way through. He owns them all. But he tells us, to be obedient in giving because he wants to bless us. And that's what he wants to do. So you can give online. We do have a, a box in the back of the sanctuary here. If you want to drop in your check or cash or however you want to give, you can drop that in there. And you can also give online. Thank you again for your giving. And um, we do have some announcement videos this morning. And just before we show those announcement videos, we want to release the children for Children's Church. So... If your kids aren't already gone, they can be released at this time to go to Children's Church. Cue the announcement video. Good morning, Bridgeview. Today at 5 o'clock, we'll be meeting at Lions Park for our annual church picnic. Don't forget to bring some chairs, something to share, and... If you're planning on entering the beanbag toss competition, you can pre-register your team right now at bridgeview.info. This will help us a ton in getting set up and playing right away. So remember, that's today at 5 over at Lions. We'll see you there. This week, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we are hosting our annual kid outreach called BBX, Vacation Bible Experience. This year is going to be a year unlike any we've ever had. We have a ton of students already signed up, but hey, there's still time. Invite your friends, invite your kids' friends, invite everyone, and make sure to register before Thursday so we're ready for you. Please be praying for our VBX that it goes super well and that our kids encounter Christ and leave here forever changed by his good news. Next Wednesday night, we have a worship night. Come on out from 6.30 to 8 as we gather together to worship our God and celebrate the great things he's doing. All right. Awesome. Well, hello, church. I'm, I'm uh, Pastor Tyler. I'm the youth and associate pastor, and you guys are like, Pastor Steve's back, so we don't need you anymore. But no, I'm, I'm here again, so you're stuck with me for just a minute or two more. Hey, uh, at our church, we love to honor our volunteers, and so it is the time of the, uh, the month that we're going to do that. We're going to honor volunteers. So our volunteer this of uh, the month this uh, month is incredible. She has been doing and amazing things behind the scenes that people um, 
have not, have, may, maybe you don't notice because you're not here, but she's been here like all the time working, helping. She works in kids. She's one of our deaf interpreters. She recently went with our youth group to Valley Fair as a chaperone. She has been helping set up our VIP room for kids volunteers when they come uh, in, uh, when we go to two services. It's going to be a great time. So Connie Ha, you are our volunteer of the month. Come on down. Connie, thank you for all you do. We just want to honor you and just say we appreciate you and everything that you do at our church. So thank you so much. All right. You can go ahead and take a seat. All right. And now it's my privilege and honor to welcome back to the stage uh, <laughs> Pastor Steve. And I've got you a newcomer's gift so that you oh, can be nice. up to date on what's been happening thank this you. last That's six, so nice of you. six weeks. But uh, it's right. good to have you back. You know, I didn't have a mug yet, right? I have an old mug, but not a new one. So now I got a new mug, right? So I, that's mine for good. But well, man, thank you so much. Man, it is so good to be back. And so thank you so much for everything, man. It has been, it has been awesome. And so some of you are like, who is this guy, right? Like, who is this guy? I, I'm Pastor Steve. I'm the lead pastor. Uh, I do. There are actually faces out here. I'm like, who is this person, right? Like, you started and within the last seven weeks. And so uh, I'm so glad that you're with us. Uh, hopefully, after today, you're like, that guy, uh, okay, I'll stay around longer because he, oh, he's all right, right? Hopefully, don't leave now, right? After you hear me preach, you're like, wow, this is the pastor. No, I don't think so. But uh, no, hope that's not, that's not the case. But man, it is so good to be back. Uh, my wife and I were gone. If you don't know, we were gone for a few weeks on sabbatical. It was wonderful. It was awesome. It was uh, restful. It was, it was a godly, restful time. Uh, people like me who are type A people don't oftentimes appreciate rest, right? Like, I don't always like that. And so it was good. I, I was a good boy. I, I did rest. I, took, I turned my phone off a lot. Um, I didn't take a lot of time with uh, church stuff. I, I, I did a good job. And so I was actually quite, and we got a little ring there. There, there we go. My voice is loud, right? Like, they're not used to my voice yet. Uh, being back. But uh, man, a couple updates on, on when I was gone. Uh, we spent a ton of time as a family together, and we didn't go crazy being together, right? Like we enjoyed uh, the, our time as a family together. It was wonderful. Uh, as a pastor, you don't always get to do that as much as you'd like. And so uh, that time was a gift in, in that way. I, I got some cowboy boots, right? So I bought cowboy boots. You might see that, right? I'm trying to fit in around here, right? So uh, I want to be cool like Pastor Joe because he wears cowboy boots. And, and Rick Vaughn, Rick's not here today. Well, no, and Dan Johnson. I was getting you too, Dan. And, and so Rick Vaughn's not here today. Uh, he, he's better be watching. If you're watching, Rick, I'm cool like you now. And Dan Johnson, uh, these guys wear cowboy boots. I'm just trying to fit in around here, right? And so uh, I got some cowboy Boy boots. It was awesome. Our, our, our staff did an incredible job. They, they give it up for our staff this morning. Man, they did an incredible job. Uh, preaching, leading, filling in. Literally, I, I, didn't, I didn't have to do a thing. They did everything for me. I, I want to especially uh, recognize Pastor Tyler. Uh, he stepped up in an amazing, amazing way. Give it for Pastor Tyler if you would. He did so much um, around here. I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of him. He, he did such a great job. And so I'm just so appreciative of, of all those that stepped up in so many ways. I, I, I whittled down the fun home project. And so I've got two, I got two lists. I've got jobs I don't want to do at home, and I got ones that I want to do at home. And so I, I, I was like, I'm not going to do the jobs I don't want to do. I'm going to do the ones I do want to do. I, I whittled that down. It was awesome. I had all kinds of fun with that. And one of the cool things I did too is I visited other churches. My wife and I visited churches all over the place. Uh, uh, we saw some interesting things. It was very interesting being on the other side of the stage, right? Like, I mean, I've been a pastor since the year 2000. I, I've rarely had a chance to not be in a church that I work at over the last however many years that might be. So for six weeks, I was. Uh, I, I saw how it is for you guys, right? Like, I, I appreciate, you, you know, on the other side a little bit more. And, and one thing I, I learned that was just interesting was that it is very awkward to be a first-time visitor at church. It is very awkward. And, and so, and I, I'm an extreme extrovert, right? And it's awkward. And so, if you're new with us this morning, man, thank you for being here. I get you now, right? Like, I get it. So, uh, and no, it's tough, but we're back, 
And I've got seven weeks of pent up preaching energy, right, to unleash on you today. No, that's not, that's not true. I'm, well, that is true, seven weeks, but I, I'm, we're going to do a good job this morning. Man, today, I, I just, you can bring that up, Robert, if you want to. Uh, um, I, I'm going to reflect this morning on, on my last seven weeks. This morning, we're going to go back to Romans next week. I'm excited for that. But I've been praying and thinking a lot about what I wanted to talk about today. God really gave me some, some, some insights some thoughts as to what I'm going to preach on and talk through here this morning. Because again, when you, your first week back, your first time back, you're going to have some thoughts and you're going to have some insights, hopefully. And, and so today, I just want to give you some, just kind of sum up a little bit about what God's been doing in my life. And I think it's going to be helpful for all of us. Uh, last week when I was in Tanzania, um, and I'll talk about that, of course, again in a future date, a lot more of what we did over in Tanzania is incredible. Uh, uh, but I was at a service over there, and it was one of, of many, literally, we would get to church at like 6 in the morning and then go, to, go like back to the hotel at midnight, and that entire time was church service. So don't ever complain about how long we are. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, no it, was, it was awesome. But one of those times, I was sitting there, and God gave me the picture of a door. And as I looked back and summed up kind of what God was doing in my life, I, I, I saw this. And, and, you know, doors are a part of our lives, aren't they? Most of our lives, we spend time going in and out of doors and never think twice about doing that. I'll bet you today, you probably can't count how many times you have walked in and out of a door. You probably can't count that. I mean, even just in my bedroom area alone, there's three doors. There's the, there's the closet, there's our main door, and there's the bathroom, right? And so in and out this morning I was at 6 in the morning or whatever to not wake up Lisa, which I don't do a good job of that. I usually do anyway. I'm sorry, babe. But, you know, I was in and out of those doors. I mean, you probably couldn't think of how many times you have been in and out of a door even just today. They're a part of our lives. We use them all the time. Right? We're, we're thankful for them, especially when that, that white van that comes down the, your, 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 your neighborhood with, the, with the, the guy that's selling steaks in it, right? You know, you can, you can run to your house and close the door and hide behind it when the steak guy comes, right? That's a real life story. And so thank God for doors in moments like that. And some of you are like, well, I'm a steak guy. Well, I'm sorry. If you are, you're used to getting offended, right? So I'm sorry about that. But anyway, you know, so thank God for doors in moments like that. But again, we don't think a lot about doors. We just use them. The reason is, is because what's inside or outside of the door is what's important. Yet, Jesus, in John chapter 10, Jesus compares himself to the door. If you would, open your Bible this morning to John chapter 10. And Jesus it has these, 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 these sayings here in John 10 where he compares himself to different things. He says, I am this, and I am this. And, he, and the third one, he compares himself to a door, which again is an interesting comparison. Because normally, in normal parts of life, the door is not the point and the purpose. What's inside or what's outside the door matters. But Jesus says, I am the door. And he gives us this as a comparison, as an illustration about who he is. See, Jesus is not just a good teacher Right? He wasn't just a, a, a prophet. He wasn't just like a nice guy who walked around wearing Birkenstocks and looked like a hippie and had the sash, you know, going on. Which, by the way, my shirt looks like Jesus' sash. I just thought about that just now. But, you know, uh, you know they, Jesus was more than this. See, a lot of people are okay with that Jesus. They're not okay, however, with who Jesus really was. Jesus said, he said, I am not a door. He said, I am the door. And Jesus here in this passage gives us an exclusive word about who he is. When he says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. Right? The sheep did not hear those. He said the sheep heard someone else. He said, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and he will go out and he will find pasture. 
Again, what I love here is Jesus does not say, I am a door. He does not say, I am one of the many ways you can find hope and find life. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways that, you know, you're looking for something, you're opening doors and trying to find something. He didn't say, there's a lot of doors, a lot of those work, just I'm one of those, right? Now, we live in a culture and a world today that would like to think that way and, in fact, is believing that way and leaning that way. Jesus does not say that. He is quite clear when he says, I am the door. Now, to get his point, it's helpful for us to kind of understand a little bit about sheep and and about the culture of shepherding back in Bible times. Now, here's some sheep facts today. Of all domesticated animals, sheep are the most helpless. Sheep will spend their day, they'll graze, they'll, they'll wander and they'll never look up. They will literally just go down. They'll just graze, graze, graze. They'll find a little spot here. They'll wander all over the place, and they'll never look up. And before you know it, before they know it, they're someplace else, and they're totally lost. Now, I had this happen me before when I've been on a raft on the lake, right? You know, I'm laying there on the raft, close my eyes, enjoy some quiet time. And, you know, again, it's a new me now, right? Like I'm a new, I'm a new person. I'm, I'm a restful person now. And so, so I, I, you know, you kind of go along and you kind of just enjoy yourself. And before you know it, you open your eyes and you're someplace else that you don't know where you were. Now, for the most part, we as humans get this. You know, I know where to go. I know how to get back. But, but sheep don't have that sense. It's called a homing capability. Now, my cats have that, unfortunately, right? So when my cats, like, wander off, they know where to go back home. I, again, unfortunately, they know. But sheep don't have that same ability. When they wander, they can wander forever, and they have no concept. Sheep can literally be just a couple of hundred yards from where they wandered from, and they will have no idea how to get back. See, it's interesting that Jesus compares us to sheep, isn't it? For that very reason. And Jesus compares and says, hey, you guys are a lot like sheep. And friends, this morning, have you been there? Man, there's been times in life when it just seems like you have wandered and you've gone and you need someone to help you come back to the fold. Jesus says this is who who he is. Another fact, sheep are followers. If, If the lead sheep... Uh, steps off a cliff, others will follow. Now, that'll preach, right? There are, some, there are some lead sheep. As a pastor, I am not a shepherd as much as I am the lead sheep, right? And so there are people out there that are leading the sheep off of cliffs, right? That's a literal thing that happens, That's how, you know, I won't say dumb, but that's just how it works with sheep, right? Like, they are easily led off off of cliffs. And again, as the lead sheep, you'd be the first one to go off there, whatever. But I I see that in our culture today too, right? People being led off the, off the, the cliff by somebody else. Friends, listen to me this morning. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to be in his court I want to be in his, I want to be in him. I want to follow him. I want to know him. I want to know his voice. I don't want to open doors and I don't want to look behind doors and try to find life here and find life there. I don't want to try to find life someplace else unless it is through the door. Not a door, but the door. And Jesus says you can look behind doors, but there is just one door that leads to life. Again, it's so interesting that Jesus says uh, he is the door because so often we don't think of doors as being all that important. Let's continue. Sheep are susceptible to injuries and they are helpless against predators. If a wolf enters the flock, sheep will not defend themselves. Interestingly, what sheep will do is sheep will gather together in one small area, they'll kind of hover together, and the wolf's like, that was easy. Right? Like, okay, all right. That was, I thought this would be a challenge. That's pretty simple. See, this makes them easy prey. They won't fight. They won't run. They won't spread. They huddle together, and they are easy, they're easy prey. 
And then what's interesting too is in the evening, the, the shepherd, it says back then, this doesn't happen, this still happens to a certain degree now. Um, I, I literally, and when I was in Africa, they still have shepherds, like old school shepherds in Africa. We were driving someplace, I don't know where you were, but you're someplace, and, and there was a shepherd that was leading sheep across the road uh, when I was in Africa. And it was just, you know, it was like the old school times. And so what happens is there's two kinds of pens at night. And so the shepherd wants to keep their sheep safe. And so uh, if, if there's bad weather or if there's danger around, uh, they'll lead them into a public pen. And public pens would be near cities or would be in villages or that kind of thing. And there would be all kinds of different flocks intermingled there within this pen. So you can imagine this, the, the shepherd takes his sheep and there they, there's this big pen there and there's like 30,000 sheep or whatever they might be and they lead them in there. The sheep kind of go and find some friends and hang out, maybe make more sheep, I don't know, but they're just going to kind of go hang out in that, in that pen until the next morning when the shepherd comes back and his voice and his voice alone leads them back out of the pen and out to be, to be fed. Pen, the pen was, of course, not a great spot to eat because it would be pretty well taken over. I mean, they needed to get out, but, the, but there was no, there was no you know, differentiation. But there, there, was, there was just the voice of the shepherd to lead them back out to pasture. How important, especially in a time like this when, we are, when, they're, when our lives and our world is marked by all kinds of things that are all kinds of ways how vital and how important is it that we know the voice of our shepherd? See, this is what Jesus is. And the second kind of sheep pen was in the countryside where there'd be shepherds keeping their flocks. There would be this, 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 this rocks around that would be pretty high and there'd be this wall uh, around them. And they would be, they'd lead their, their sheep into this pen and there would be this opening where the shepherd would lay all day and all night. And in, in, in so doing, what would happen is the shepherd literally became the door for the sheep. He kept the sheep in, and he kept the bad guys out. The shepherd was the door. So if something came along, it could not get to the sheep because it had to get by him first. And so when Jesus says, I am the door, when Jesus says, I am not a door, I am the door, what Jesus is communicating to us is this is the role that he takes in our lives. He is valuable. He is important. We have to know and have to hear his voice. Keeping the bad guys out and the good stuff in, he says that's who he is, lying across the doorway to keep us in safe and secure. Think about that this morning. When you enter through Christ, it means something. When you enter the door, when you come through, when you enter the, the door through Christ, it, it means something. It's not just a decision. You know, I think sometimes we have cheapened what God has done in our lives by calling it a decision and nothing more. Or we've said, I made a decision to follow Jesus, like I made a decision to have a ham and cheese sandwich, or I made a decision to buy a Ford truck. Because I like trucks that run. You know, because, you know, I, I made a, I had to do it. I, I, I made a decision. You see, I, I think sometimes, you to bring it back here. We, we sometimes cheapen what God's done in our lives by calling it nothing more than a decision. See, Jesus tells us this is not just a decision. He says, I am the door. I am the door. And if you enter through me, some things are going to happen. He speaks this and he shows this. But friends, this is not a door. This is not just a decision. It's a different life. There are all kinds of doorways that lead to the good life. There are doors that lead to the promised life. And, and sometimes as believers, we can find ourselves in this place as well, can't we? We say, well, I entered through the door. I came to Christ. I, I made a decision to follow Jesus. But there's truthfully many doors in my life that lead to life. I've got my family door, I've got my job door, I've got my work door, I've got my, my money door, I've got my, 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 my entertainment door, I've got whatever doors you might have, I've got all these doors and all those things lead to life. What Jesus says here is there's just one. There's just one door that leads to life. 
And, and, and when we walk through these doors, they promise life, but they oftentimes and oppositely. We know in, in Proverbs chapters 14 and 16, this, this exact same phrase is repeated twice where he says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Now, now here's where this gets interesting. Our culture is celebrating all those doors. And our culture says, yeah, you can have the door of Jesus, right? But there's lots of doors that lead to life. There's lots of things that, that work. There's lots of things that you can do. Our, our culture celebrates every other way in the name of diversity and tolerance with increasingly a, a drive to self-discover who, you, who God has made you to be. But friends, the reality is there is just one door that leads to life. There is just one door that leads to the truth. Now, I think most of us will agree with that. Let's drill down a little bit this morning. I've always loved the, the line in the sand statement that Joshua made in Joshua 24, 15, when he says this. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. Were the gods of your forefathers? Yeah, no, they, they served these behind, you know, region behind the river. They, they did this. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. I've always loved that statement. That is a good, that's good stuff. You see, the, this is the decision that dictates everything about how I operate. You know what this has made me? This is not maybe a person that made a decision. What this is, is it's made me a door holder in the kingdom of God. My life looks like this now. My life looks like somebody who's here to hold the door open for other people to walk through and discover and know the life that I have found. God's called us to be door holders in his kingdom. Every single one of us, that's your life. That's your heart. And as I sat in Africa watching how they operate and watching how they did things, what I saw is I saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who get it, who understand that my life's not my own. I've been bought with a price. I've made a decision. I have changed my life. I have walked through the door. And that has made me a door holder in the kingdom of God. And that is who I am. That dictates some things. Give God some glory this morning. I know you want to. Man, our life is that. Our church is that. Holding the door open. But think about this this morning. This is where, I, this, is where this is going to drill down today. Every door swings on hinges. Look at what it says in John 10. 10. It says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. This is, again, part of our, of our text this morning. Jesus says, I'm the door. I'm not a door. I'm the door. You know, we just read that, that there. He says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they might have life, and they might have life more abundantly. You have, I have, we have a real enemy. And that enemy would love nothing more than to take us off of what God has called us to do. If there's anything in this world that we, have, that we can see, next slide please, you can see this morning that this is what life looks like today, right? This is what happens when you set the flux capacitor to 2020, nope, 2021, nope, 20, this is our life, isn't it? There are so many examples and moments where, where we think, what else can happen? What else can go wrong? We are living in a time, we are living in a day when, man, more and more people can become unhinged. There are some that have made decisions to follow Jesus, but for a myriad of reasons have become unhinged. Friends, I don't want to become unhinged. I don't want to become unhinged with what God has called me to be. And so next few moments this morning, I just want to just, I want to share just some things that God's doing in my own life today. And I think it'll be helpful for all of us. I have, I have eight contrasts today. Now, don't worry. I know it sounds like a lot. Um, it's, I, I'm not going to go for a long time this morning. But I, I just, I want to just give some reflections today about where God's leading me 
Because as God gave me this vision and, and when I was in Africa, that was the word that so often came is that, God, I don't want to become unhinged. There's a lot of people that have started off well. There's a lot of people that started off in good spots that have somehow along the way have become unhinged. I don't want that to be, to be in my life and in my heart, so I'm praying through these, contact, these contrasts, and I think it will help you too. The first one this morning is truth, not fiction. This first one is there for a purpose and for a reason. I want to be a man who walks in truth and not fiction. As you can see there in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Stand firm then with a belt of truth that is buckled around your waist. You ever think about why Paul, the Apostle Paul who wrote this, why he used the word, why he used the word buckle and, and belt to compare us and help us understand what, what truth is? The reason is, is because tr- a, a belt keeps your pants up, doesn't it? If you've ever been in a situation where you've lost your trousers, that would be an embarrassing situation, right? The older I get, the bigger this gets, the more important it is for me to listen to this, right? Like, I got to have a belt to keep my pants up because if you don't have that, it's embarrassing. And the truth this morning is this, is there are a lot of people out there that are following things and doing things that are finding themselves in places where it's not truth they're walking in, it's something else. See, this is what I want my life to be. I want to stay close to the maker of all truth. Do you know what else Jesus says he is? He says he is the way, he is the what? He is the truth, and he is the life. I don't want spin. I don't want fiction that feels good and tells me what I want to hear but isn't true. I don't want what is unnecessarily mean and puts people in bondage because it's truth plus something else. I want truth. I want to fight for truth. I want truth for my family. I want truth for my friends. I want truth for my circle of influence, which brings me to the next thing today, to not become unhinged. I want to walk in bravery and not fear. Now, I want to talk this morning to the guys just for a moment. Now, not that ladies are not brave. You are very brave. In fact, and I've seen some women in our church that have bravery in spades. But guys, I want to talk to you for a moment this morning because what I've seen happen in our world, and you've seen this too, is that our culture is increasingly telling us something that we are not. It is celebrating wimps. It's celebrating people, men, that cannot stand up or should not stand up and fight for what's right. That men who do that are dangerous. Men who do that are morally wrong because men could never know what's right. All men can do is oogle women and drink beer and go to work, right? That's the point of of what it means to be a guy. That's not the truth. Guys, God has made us to be brave, not fearful. God's made us to stand up for our families, to stand up for what's right, to stand up for the truth and be men of bravery and not men of fear. Now back to all of us this morning. Our culture is normalizing and increasing this idea that fear is normal. But I remind you this morning what the scriptures teach us, for God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Think about the world around us. Think of what's happening around us. If one thing is not happening, it is that fear is normal, right? I mean, think about all the chances you've had, and I've had, all of us have had to be fearful, even the last couple of weeks and months. And again, what's happening is it's becoming normal. It's becoming part of life, right? This is who we are. It's just, it's just, this is just it. Friends, I don't want to operate in fear this morning. Anyone with me today, we're not doing that. We're not walking in fear. It's time that we look at scriptures like this and not see this as just an inspiring quote. But that this is who God has made us to be. Someone who does not have a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Give me an amen this morning, somebody, please. Amen. Come on. I want to be brave. Number three, number, number three I want to invest, not hoard. Now more than ever, especially as resources are stretched, I want to invest in things that matter, not hoard things that don't. 
I, I heard the other day that inflation is, what, 9.1%. I mean, it's just, of course, this is part of life, right? This is the, the new reality. Friends, God has promised blessing when we live generously. Yeah. I, I love what Jeff said this morning, period. Listen to what the scripture says here. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. One thing God's been just working in my life on is not as much money, although that certainly is in this case, but also my time and my talents. I want to invest my life in what matters. I don't want to invest my life. I don't want to invest my time in hoarding what's good for me. I want to invest my time, invest my resources, my time, my money, my talents, all these things, and give. I don't want to see it die in selfishness. I want to see, get to the end and see that I've invested in things that are growing dividends. I, I saw this last week in Africa firsthand. As you see the next slide here this morning, this is a picture today. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this a lot more the future day. This is just perfect for here. You see those two pictures, those classrooms. Church, that's what you did. Those classrooms are what you built in Africa. And I got to stand in those classrooms and I got to hear and listen to these young people being trained on how to church plant. Give God some glory, friends. You did this. What you see here is you see one example of many across the nation of Tanzania where there is revival happening. Revival is breaking out in this nation. It's incredible. And one thing that they need is they need trained pastors. So what we did is we invested big and built a school to start the process of training for these pastors. That's what you see right there. Those classes are happening today. And what's going to happen is these individuals will go through these classes. They're going to graduate this school. They're going to go out and plant churches all around the country. I talked to one young man in this class, and he said, God gave me a vision of some town that I cannot pronounce. And he said, I'm going there. I'm praying for it. God's going to use me. God's going to bless it because he's called me. One of those people in that class, you paid to be trained to go do that. Again, give God glory this morning, church. That, that is what it's all about. As I stood there in that classroom, I wept. I said, God, this is what it matters. This is what it's about. And then you see the next slide over. You see those pictures of those people in the white. And those people are those who are being ordained into ministry. They have walked through the church planning process. They have planted churches successfully. They have gone to Bible college and then have graduated. They have done all these things. And at this service, we laid hands on and we anointed with oil hundreds of people that are being released into ministry amen they started they started back in the school we built and there we are there they are finished you know what i thought i, I stood out there and i looked and again I, I i have this this video that i shot and i don't have it right with me right now but of when we, we we laid hands and prayed for these people they began to weep and began to dance and shout and sing. And truthfully, it was very, very loud in that room when these guys were getting, were getting ordained for, for ministry. And I looked out on this crowd of just hundreds and hundreds of people who were going into ministry, and God said, Steve, the church is okay. You sometimes think, and this is God's Speaking to me, you sometimes think the church is in trouble. It's not a trouble. This is the church, Steve. These are the, those that I've called, and they are going out. And frankly, if we, if we walk away from God in this country, they'll come preach to us. I believe that with all my heart. And friends, the church is okay because God has it. This is what you invested in. I want to invest in things that matter. Which brings me to number, to number four. I want to focus and not scatter. This is a hard one for me. I'm going to be, I, I, I want to be a person who is honest and who is real with all of us. And this one is incredibly hard for me. Again, I'm an, I, I'm an idea guy. 
I'm a guy that loves to talk about all kinds of crazy things and crazy ideas. And God has been, this last season of my life, God has been really working into me to change that to become more focused on things that matter. And I want to be focused, and I don't want to scatter. See, the passage here that I put up there, to he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Sometimes, in all, my, all of my heart and all of my desire, I scatter and I scatter and I scatter. And I do all kind of things because I, I want God to do, to do something amazing and something good, but God has called me in this season of my life to change and become more focused on what matters, to listen to his voice and focus and not scatter. You know what I want to do this next season of my life? I want to love my wife like she deserves. I, I, I want to love my family and my kids like they deserve. Again, this last season of my life, I got to see some just incredible young ladies that God is raising up and God's blessing in my family, and I love it. It's wonderful. I want to invest in that. I want to pass something down to the next generation. I want to invest finances so that they have something to go on. I want to invest time so they have something to go on. But most importantly, I want to pass down a faith that is brave, that is strong, that is true, that means something, right? I want to pass down a faith that means something to the next generation. I don't want to scatter. I want to focus. I want to be an example for others. I want my kids to be raised loving the body of Christ and being committed to worshiping him and using their talents and their gifts in God's house. I want to be someone to help someone find and follow Jesus. I want to participate in that. I want to walk in that. I want to focus and not scatter. And number five, I want to operate in foundations. Lisa, can I see that? And not rumors. There's a lot of rumors happening out, out there right now, aren't there? There's a lot of rumors in, in our world today. There's a lot of things that might even possibly be true. But one thing that I think we need to understand is promoting them or devoting our lives to them going to help us or going to hurt us. It's a question that all of us must wrestle with in times like this. When the enemy would love nothing more than to take you off your game and take you off of what God's called you to and put you on something else to focus on rumors and not foundational truth. See, Paul said this to his young apprentice Timothy in 1 Timothy, where you see he says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. I've got a golf club here today, as you can see. Um, I am not an expert golfer by any means, but this comes from my office. If you've been in my office, you've probably seen my golf club at some point. And and I've had people say, do do you use that? Yes, I do. Um, I, I use this to train how to be a better putter. And so I will sit there in my office and I will putt. Um, I'm, I'm also working, again, type A, a little crazy. I need, I need some of my hands to think sometimes. And so, so I, I will sit here and I will train myself on how to become a better putter. And sometimes it works and then sometimes it doesn't because I will get out on the golf course and realize I need a lot more training. But truthfully, what I use to train myself matters. What Paul's talking about here this morning is that there's a very important correlation between how we train ourselves and how we walk as godly people. There are some people in our culture and our world today that are training themselves with endless wise tales and rumors and not the foundational truth of God's words. We are finding ourselves, training ourselves to think about what believing things we don't know is true or, or not true and not putting our lives and our foundation on what God's word tells us that is without question and true. It bears this question this morning. What am I training my worldview with? Man, you got to think about that this morning. Because in our time, in our season, in our culture, in our worlds. Sometimes we are training ourselves with nothing but the foundational truth of God's word. What's going to happen someday? I don't know. 
what's going to happen someday, what's going to happen in our nation, what's going to happen. I, I don't know if any of us know for sure. I do know this, that there is one way that leads to life. There is one door. There is one God. There is one truth. There is one baptism. Just one. On the way, the truth and the life, no man comes unto the Father except by me. Friends, I want to train my life to think like that. As you continue here in this passage, it says there's some incredible truth here that Paul gives in 1 Timothy. He says, I urged you when I was, went to Macedonia to stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good, con good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have become unhinged. Some have departed from these things and have turned over to meaningless talk. Friends, I think we're in the end times. I don't know. I think we, it's possible. Do you know how much the enemy would love to take you off of what God's word says that is foundational and true and put you on something else, to believe something else and put your life on something else? Don't you think the enemy can work and operate like that? Friends, I don't want that to be how it ends for me. God, Paul gave massive wisdom when he said, man, put your life not on rumors, but on foundational truth. Be careful what you do with rumors. If I could have Heidi come back and just play keys just for a little bit. The number, ne next one today is faith, not pessimism. This needs little explanation. It takes a conscious effort to resist pessimism. I'm in for it. Are you with me? I was on the plane coming back from, from Africa, and I saw this happen in real time. When, I'll be honest with you, I was tired. It was a long trip, and so I was just, I was worn out, and I was on this plane, and I was looking around me, and there's people in every single seat. There's people in every single spot, and it was looking at a, a long trip, and I walked in a time where I did not have faith. I had pessimism. And I looked at this plan, I said, this, this flight is going to be terrible, right? And so I walk in, I, I, I'm about to sit down, I'm like, this flight's going to be terrible. And I sit down next to this, this Muslim lady who looks at me and she says, I don't want to sit by you. And I'm like, okay. And she, go, and she goes, I want to find someone else to sit by me. I said, well, why not? She goes, You're, he goes I got two men in the seat. I don't want you to be, I don't want to sit by you. Can you please move? And I said, well, this is my spot. And she goes, I don't want to sit by you. And, and so I'm like, I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm going to show my ticket. This is, here it is. I'm, like, I'm sitting down thinking, oh, great. Not only is this flight going to be long and hot and awful, but now this lady doesn't want to sit by me. And God spoke and said, maybe I've got you there for a purpose and for a reason. I looked over and heard. I didn't tell. I was like, I'm not going to, whatever. I'm going to say, I'm going to make this flight for you just a little better. I said, I'm not going to move. <laughs> it's like, don't have a spot to sit. But what I am going to do, I thought this. I thought, I'm going to make as good as I possibly can for this woman. See, friends, we sometimes look at the world in that, in that light, don't we? We see what's happening around us and look at moments of, uh, of difficulty and say, this is going to stink. This is going to be tough. I don't want to operate like that. Are you with me this morning? I want to walk in unity, not division. Friends, the church should lead the way in showing the world what unity looks like. Now, not unity with those who have been taken by lies. That's not our point. That's not our purpose. In fact, Ephesians 5, 11 says you're calling to expose those. But friends, I refuse to let the enemy divide my sphere of influence over things like race, economics, vaccines, lack thereof, you name it. There is just too many opportunities to be divided. I will not be divided. The world is dividing along those lines, not us. The church should be the example to the world and not the follower of the world. 
I don't want to divide along those lines. I want unity, not division. Again, I want to be clear. Not unity with those who would say there is many doors that lead to life. No. That's wrong. But I want unity with those who understand that, this is God, that, that what God's done in our lives is, is a good thing. I want unity there. Friends, the world is dividing us. What if the world looked to the church and saw a different light, a different world, a different person, a different body, a different people? My prayer in this next season of our church in my life is that we have this kind of unity. My prayer in this next season of, our, of my life is that I walk in unity with those who love and have, and have come to know Jesus. I don't want to walk in division. I want to walk in unity. That's what God's called us to. The Word tells us there's blessing when the, blood, when the brothers dwell in unity. There's blessing. The, the Word actually tells us that, that, that blessing is commanded when the brothers and the sisters and the church walks in unity. That's going to be us. And last one, if you would st stand this morning to your feet. I want spirit-filled, love-driven action, not indifference. Let's turn this place this morning into a place of prayer for the next few moments. I want spirit-filled, love-driven action, not indifference. Indifference is the new drug of our culture. It's not anger, it's not bitterness, it's indifference. It makes sense. We're tired, we've been divided, we've been confused, we've got many doors that seem to lead to life, and some of us have said, maybe that door is the door, maybe that door will help me better. We, there's, there's no, there's, it, it makes sense why we are filled with so much indifference, because we've come, some of us have come to the place where we said, what else do I do? I'm indifferent. Not me. I want spirit-filled, love-driven action, not indifference. I want to hear God's voice when I'm sitting in a, in, a, in a plane seat and God says, make her day. I want to hear God's voice when I walk in a holiday and God says, hey, pay for the gas of that person. Right? Now, that one I really have to hear because gas is expensive, but whatever. <laughs> I want to hear the I want to hear his voice. I want to hear his voice when I am wandering away from truth into something else. I want to hear his voice. I want to hear his voice when I'm viewing somebody else from eyes that are not God's eyes. I want spirit-filled, love-driven action. Because, friends, do you know this? That the best way to not walk in indifference is action. Amen? That's what I want. Jesus, make us a people that does not walk in indifference. In, in but Lord walks in spirit-filled, love-driven action. Would you raise your hands? Would you raise your hearts this morning? And maybe you're here today and you do not know Jesus. Your first step today. Maybe you're sensing God's presence or a call or whatever. You say, man, this makes sense to me. I need him. The first thing you do today, the first action you take, say, God, my life my future, my hope is yours. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for what I've done. Forgive me, wash me, make me. Pray that prayer, and that's the beginning. That's not it. That's the beginning of a life of change where God will take you from what you were and make you into something that you were not. Amen? Church, is that what God does? Give me, some, give me something this morning. Amen? That's what God does this morning. But for all of us this morning, if Jesus is the door, and I put big quotes around if because he is, whatever he offers when I walk through it, that's what I want, including him as the door. I don't want my life to be unhinged. Are you with me this morning? Jesus. our call. That's our heart. 
Lord, I don't want my life to become unhinged with something else that it shouldn't be. So this morning, Lord, once more, one more time, Lord, I lead us as a church body, Lord, as the head sheep, Lord Jesus, back to you. Lord, you are the shepherd, Lord Jesus. And this morning, God, I ask and I pray that, Lord, if there are those here today that, Lord, need a call back, that you would do that. Lord, if there are those who need a gentle call back, that you would do that this morning. Maybe there's those that have wandered some. Lord, call them back to the folds. Maybe there's there's those here this morning, God, that just are a little bit disoriented with where things are in the world today. Lord, you are the door. Lord, you are the shepherd. You are the one. Lord God, lead them, reassure them, remind them you sit in the door and you protect them and you are there for them, Lord Jesus. Lord, call us, Lord Jesus. I pray we be a church, Lord, spirit-filled, love-driven, action-oriented people, not ones of indifference. As the band plays this morning and leads us in worship, I just want to encourage you to give God some time to speak into your life here today. We'll close in a moment, but let's let God work today in our heart.
praise Jesus. Worthy, 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 worthy. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Praise the Lord. Someone has a word from God right now to share with the people, a, an encouraging word. If God's given you that word, go ahead right now and share that out. This is the time to do that. Jesus. Give God some glory this morning, church. If you're, if you're new with us, you might say, well, what, is, what was that? Well, the Bible teaches us in 1 Corinthians that God gives gifts to the church, and one of those gifts is a gift of, of, of knowledge that's given out as an encouragement to people's response to God this morning. If God has stirred your heart, and you would say at the end of this, this day, this morning, you say, God, I want spirit-filled love in action, not indifference. If that's you, would you raise your hand across this room? All across this room, say, God, that's me. That's what I want. That's who I want to be. Lord, I want to be a person of spirit filled love and action, not indifference. If your hand is raised this morning, would you pray a dangerous prayer with me today and say, God, give me a chance this week, Lord to exercise this. Lord, this week, God, I pray that across this room, Lord, as hands are raised, Lord, give us a chance, Lord, to use this, Lord, to exercise this. Maybe at holiday, Lord, it might be at work, it might be at school, Lord, it might be in our home, Lord, it might be with our family, our friends, our neighbors, Lord, who, who knows what, Lord, give me, give Lord, the understanding and the wisdom, Lord, to act in spirit-filled love and action. And Lord, we will not, as a church, act in indifference. If you're with me this morning, would you say amen and amen? Come on, somebody. God is good this morning. Amen? Come on. The band's going to keep playing today. If I could have the prayer team come forward. God might be doing something in your life this morning and you want prayer. You want, you want prayer of healing. You need prayer for deliverance. Whatever that might be today, these people are going to be here today and expect and pray. Do you realize that a couple weeks ago, someone was healed right here at this altar and I wasn't even here. It was pretty awesome. And so I've heard some really cool things. God works when we respond to him. Amen? Man, they're going to be here to pray as long as we need. May God bless you. May God keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious in you this week. And get ready, right? For what? For spirit-filled love in action, not indifference. We'll see you again next Sunday morning. God bless you.